Well, good morning. We just thank the Lord for each and every one of you that took time to come out and be a part of this service this morning. It's a blessing that the Lord has given us a place that we can come and worship together and be able to open His Word. Uh, for those that may be joining us for the first time or for a little while, you know we've been looking at various themes of the Bible. We're looking at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we're looking to Him. We looked at His deity and His eternity last week. But before we get started this morning, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, well, uh, Pastor, since you're back with us again, it's nice to have you. Why don't you open our time here this morning, if you would, please, brother. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Oh, how important it is that we understand this major theme of the Bible, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You may want to mark your Bibles this morning to John chapter 14. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. And also Luke, uh, that's going to be chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And also in the second chapter of Luke, we'll be looking at 5 and 7. We'll be looking at other verses as well. But if you want to kind of do that and get them marked ahead of time, it might be good as we go through our study here this morning. And I want us to consider for a few minutes here this morning... We've looked at God, we've looked at the Son of God, we've seen how the deity, and we've seen His deity, and we've seen how He is eternal. How the Scriptures present the Lord Jesus Christ as being perfectly human and perfectly divine. In other words, Jesus Christ, the Bible is very clear as we look at all these multitude of, of uh, Scriptures that we've been able to look at. We looked at some of them last week, we certainly couldn't go through them all. But we see that Jesus Christ truly was 100% man, wasn't he? He was in flesh and blood. He thungered, he thirsted, all of those things. But we also saw how he is also at the same time 100% God. Those things have, are very important in understanding who Jesus Christ is. We talked about how he is both like and unlike man. As a person, Jesus was born of a woman. He lived and he suffered and he died. He was also unlike man. And that number one, he is eternal. In John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He is eternal. In other words, there is no place going back into all eternity that you will not find God the Son. Just as you the God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. As it will be for all eternity going forward as well. He is eternal. He pre-existed, in other words, even though he was born. He was sinless in his humanity. He is the only man who has ever lived that is, was, was completely sinless, never had any sin in his life at all. That is important for our study here this morning. His death was a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and he manifests his divine power in his glorious resurrection and his ascension. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is truly the second person of the Trinity, he is equal with God the Father and with God the Holy Spirit. Some of the other names that we may want to think about sometimes, we think about Jesus Christ, and these are just some of them, but we can think of him as the Bible calls him the only begotten Son, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord, the Lord of all, the Lord of glory, the Christ, wonderful, counselor, the, mag the, the mighty God, the Father of eternity, the Lord of glory, God, God with us, our great God, etc. There's just so many different names in, that we can look at in Scripture that give us a description of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we've seen, as we looked at last week, a, a lot of verses concerning the deity and, and the e eternality of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what we learn is that Jesus Christ truly is the theme of the entire Word of God. Yes, the main focus of the Bible is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, isn't it? From the beginning to end, as God reveals himself. He is the high mark of the Bible. When we consider the eternal Son of God becoming man, we must realize it was for the sake of saving us. Wow, what kind of, what kind of opportunity would you and I have today if there wasn't a Jesus Christ? Oh, Jesus Christ, what a blessing. But we also talked a little bit about how we want to be aware of those that would either add or subtract from the Word of God. Our Lord Jesus said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly they are ravaging wolves. And he was speaking of those who profess to be professors or, or teachers or, 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 or men of God, professing that they know God and they're going to present God. But we must understand that this is the absolute authority for God. Anything more or less to add or subtract in this book is very, very serious, and we need to be aware of it. We talked about how there's many churches that are teaching the Christ, but that Christ isn't necessarily the Christ of the Bible. It's a Christ that is somewhat man-made up. We know that there are, we know there's children of God that we can have differences. We know that there are good and godly men, for example, that can agree to disagree, can't they? On many different areas of, of Scripture. But there's some things, for example, the deity of Jesus Christ, that cannot be denied. This is an absolute doctrine that must be completely understood and accepted. One who denies the deity, the deity of Christ or his coming into flesh, which is another thing, even those who confess to believe in the Father, it simply is not so. You may recall when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the Pharisees said, we don't know you, but we know the Father. And what did Jesus say? He says, you cannot know the Father if you don't know me. If you'd have known him, you would have known me. One is inseparable from the other. And if you truly know the Father, then you would know the Lord Jesus Christ. You would recognize him as who he is. And if you know the Son, then you know the Father. But concerning the deity of Christ, we see, and you know, even though we can look in John 8, 19, when our Lord said this, he said unto them, when, when they said, where is thy father? And Jesus answered, Ye neither knew me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. You see, the doctrine of Jesus Christ is fundamental to the Christian faith. It's more than fundamental. It is literally the very foundation, the very foundation of our faith, isn't it? Without Jesus Christ, there is no faith. There is no hope. There is no anything. There is no real truth. The Lord, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If one church does not teach the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that's a church that we should not want to be associated with. If we're in such a church, we should, we should go out of that church. And we should be carefully guarding today that fundamental truth and teaching as the Word of God teaches us, the Lordship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If one does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, thus God Himself, and it doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I mean, as the Son of God, and thus God Himself, and also of Him coming into flesh, then that's a serious situation that we want to be sure that we don't be, become uninvolved with. How important is it to understand that Jesus Christ is God? And we're going to look at some of those things this morning. But before we do that, let us consider the doctrines concerning Jesus Christ. And we're going to look now at chapter 14 of John, as we mentioned a little earlier. This is some beautiful areas of Scripture. Most of us just love this area. And oftentimes we'll, we'll turn to this just to kind of lift our hearts up or, or just to... Just to uh, uh, if we're trying to share the gospel and, and just be, when we're having troubled times or whatever, when Jesus said this to his disciples, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may also, that there you may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way you know. Now, we, now when we look at verse 5 here, we'll stop just a minute here and think about Thomas for a minute. Think about Thomas. We always say doubting Thomas, right? But you know, Thomas was a pretty unique uh, apostle, wasn't he? Thomas was not one to pretend to have faith that he didn't have. 
He was, just, he was right out there. Well, you got to show me. Somebody got to prove this to me. That's the way Thomas was. So he says in verse 5, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know, we know not where thou goest, and how can we know the way? And then how precious are these next few verses? John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Wow. Do those verses just burst in your heart? I mean, just, just, I mean, so much is there, and we just get so excited when we read those. What a blessing they are to our hearts. We can look at Jesus' answer, and in essence, he answers the question, how can I be saved in the very first way? The very first thing he says is, I am the way. He is not the way. He's not saying there's a number of different ways. He's saying there is one way, and he is that way. You see, salvation comes when we understand that we're lost. And in ourselves, that literally we have no hope. There's nothing I can do to save myself. We must first come to a position in our lives that we, can, that we, that we understand that we're lost. In our own lost condition, in our own sinful state that we're into, and the pit, the miry pit that we're in, and that in and of ourselves, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Salvation must come because our God is a perfect God. There is no darkness in our God. There is no unrighteousness in our God. Therefore, a sacrifice needs to be an absolutely pure, righteous sacrifice to be acceptable unto God. Therefore, we needed a Savior to do that work in our hearts and in our lives, that we once again could be in the state that God had really designed us to be, to be a part of His family for all eternity. And actually, the Bible tells us to even be co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Those things are so beyond us, but just thinking about some of that a little bit here this morning. Yes, we must receive Jesus Christ. Come to Him to an absolute and pure sacrifice. And we must put our trust in Him in receiving, in receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. By receiving Jesus Christ as Savior, we are going to put our faith in Him. He is the way, and there is no other. There is, there is none other. Notice what that verse says in the bottom. It says, No man cometh unto the Father but what? By me. By me. There's no other way. The church can't get you there. The pastor can't get you there. Your wonderful and good works that you've worked so hard all your life to be so perfect at, that won't get you there. But what will is true faith. What will is putting our complete weight, all of us, and putting it all upon Christ, giving it all to Him, all that we are, all the sin, all that we have in our life, and confessing it, and then taking on His righteousness that He gives us through Himself. You see, when God looks at Bruce, He sees Christ. Therefore, I'm righteous in His sight. Well, most of you know me, and you know that I'm not a righteous person. I've got all kinds of faults and things. My wife, if she was here, she'd tell you I'm perfect after some 30-something years of marriage, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think she would, but you know. Uh, but anyway, I'm just saying, you know, we know those things about ourselves. So, we know from Ephesians 2.8 uh, 2, also that how clear the Bible is concerning salvation, how simple it is. It's not complicated, is it, my friends? The Bible says, for by grace you're saved, what? Through faith. Faith is what? Taking God at His word is a simple, it's a lot more than that, but the easy explanation is simply taking God at His word. 
Do you believe that Jesus Christ, when he went to that cross and died on that cross, paid 100% for all of your sins? And that when he rose from the dead, he rose into, he, 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 that was complete victory? And that through him, we are part of that victory if we've trusted in him? And we too are now new creatures in Christ? We now are part of his family? And we have all eternity to look forward to. And sin and death have no more power in our lives. For it says in Ephesians 2, For by grace you are saved through faith, that that not of yourselves. How many today are trying to teach that, you know, you need to do something to be saved? You've got to be baptized. Well, you should be baptized. But you don't have to be baptized, do you? The true baptism comes from the Holy Spirit the very moment that you're saved. Or, I need to make sure that I'm in church every time the doors are open. We should have a desire to be with those of like precious faith, to encourage one another in the faith, and to grow in faith and truth. But that's not a, that's not a criteria either, is it? Or that I'm going to not do this anymore, and I'm not going to do that anymore, but I'm going to start doing this, I'm going to start doing that. In and of myself, I'm going to become a better person. That's not going to save me either, is it? The one thing that saves me is faith and confidence in the finished and complete work of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells me when that happened, I became a new creature, a new creation in Christ. And I have a different nature now than I had before. Oh, I still have that old sin nature. We just mentioned that. But I have a different nature. And that different nature tells me, that different nature seeks out to do right things through through the Lord. Yes, Pastor. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. And they think what they've done is too bad. But God, that's that's not true with the Lord. You have to realize who God is. Jesus Christ is God. And His work is, there's no imperfection in that work. That's why it works for all that will receive it. Because it's His perfect work. And there's nothing beyond what He can do. But it's also blasphemous on our part to think that we can add anything to that work. And that's primarily the point I think the pastor's making there. We can't add to that work, can we? But we do become a new creation in Christ. And when we do, we need to understand and accept that and understand that we now have a change in our heart and we can make choices still. We still have volition, as the Bible puts it. One of the first uh, institutions the Bible set up was, was volition, which is basically choice. Even as Christians, we can choose to go off in darkness, can't we? We can maybe not be saved, maybe not. But that has nothing to do if we actually are saved. But we move further and further away from the light. And we move further and further away from that wonderful fellowship that we can have with the Lord and the blessings of the, of the joy that we can have through Him and knowing that we, that, that, that we can have peace and joy through Him and this world we don't need to be concerned about because He made the world. And everything in the world belongs to him, and I belong to him. And he's going to meet my needs according to his riches. And there's nothing greater than that. The next thing we see is, how can I be sure? The next question is kind of answers. It says, I am, he said, I am truth. I am truth. Let me say this this morning to you. There is no other truth. The truth is Jesus Christ. He is the truth. He sums up all that is eternal and absolute in himself. Jesus Christ did not merely teach the truth. He literally is the truth. He is the truth. And no matter how rich or successful religiously moral or upright, popular or powerful one is, whether they come to know God through Christ or don't come at all. The interesting thing is, it doesn't change the truth. The truth is that He is, He is the way. 
and he is the truth, and he is the life. There is none other. But we want to think about truth just a minute. And then when we say that word, some people may say, well, truth, what about truth? That's pretty arrogant to say that you're truth. Well, there's nothing arrogant about our God. He's simply Satan stating, I don't know how many of you used to watch um, Mr. Friday, Detective Friday, probably most of you aren't old enough to remember him. But, but, but yeah, 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 but he would say, uh, that's the facts, man, that's the facts. That's the truth, that's the truth. In other words, this is, this is what it is, what it is. Well, it doesn't make any difference to what anything else is. Well, this is the truth here. There's no arrogance in God. It is simply the truth is the truth. But the truth is always exclusive. And it's always dogmatic. And always intolerant of non-truth. Otherwise, it simply wouldn't be truth. Truth is eternal, and it's absolute. When I say eternal, what does that mean? It means it's always true. That's why the Word of God doesn't get old, does it? All of this Word is for us today, just as the very day it was it was written, and just as it was for eternity past and will be for eternity future. What God has to say here is going to be consistent throughout all all time. Truth is eternal and absolute and it never changes. It makes no difference whether the truth is a mathematical, a scientific truth, or a spiritual truth. It is always truth. And truth is always, in some sense, we might say narrow. You know, Jesus said this. We look at Matthew 17 and th verse 13 it says, he said, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go there thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Yes, there's many today that are walking a path, maybe believing that they're on the path. Maybe they believe that they're that, they're, that they're, the churches that they're going to, the things that they're learning, the things that, they're, that they believe that they're, that they're doing, and they're believing maybe even that they're saved because they're good people or they're this or they're that, or because of their, their church is the right church and they're good in their church. That's not consistent with the Word of God. Satan loves to use deception and to deceive, doesn't he? And he uses people. But by the same token, he's given us something much greater, hasn't he? He's given us this very word that we can check those that are teaching and preaching to us to see if they, what, we, what we find is true and is based upon what is upon this eternal book that he's given us as well. What a blessing. It is, we want to remember that truth is not error or a non-truth. You see, non-truths and error can be very broad, can't they? They can be extremely broad, as we just looked at. And we might want just a simple one this morning. Consider mathematical truth. Two times four equals... Anybody help me? Anybody know what that is? Two times... I mean, two times two is what? You sure? It's not three? Pastor, now come on now. How about five? Well, we can make it broader, can't we? Can we just broaden it out a little bit? Is that truth? What he said was truth. Two times two is four, isn't it? It's always four. That's truth. Consistency. We want to remember that. It never can be accepted any other way or tolerated any other way. So when we say Jesus is truth, he excludes all error. No matter how popular, we want to keep these things in mind. Some things may seem very popular in the world. But if it's contrary to the Word of God, or a widespread or ancient, or convincing as it may be, it's not true if it's not the truth. And we need to be aware. And we need to guard against those things that want to creep in 
into our churches, into our lives, that can draw us away from the truth of the Word of God, of Jesus Christ, and the plan that He has for each of us in our lives. Because each of us have a, have a plan. We are to be, we know from the Word of God, we see, we're, of course, this is uh, Paul talking to Timothy, and some say it's to the preachers, but I believe it's to all of us, when it says we're to, to be instant in season and out of season. In 2 Timothy 4, 1 it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And notice what verse 4, 2 says in 2 Timothy. It says, he said, told him, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering the doctrines. And then in verse 3 he says, For the time will come when they will endure sound, when they will no longer endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap upon themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away and their, their, their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. There's a great warning here. There are those that are going to teach things and preach things that people want to hear. They make them feel good about different things. The preaching and teaching should be about one thing, and that is the very Word of God, the glorification of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and seeking out His instruction through His Word, His truth, for our very lives, the truth of what our lives are to be before Him. The opportunities that we have by God's grace to be His children and to be about our Lord's business, to have that kind of confidence. Yes, Jesus said, No man cometh un, uh, unto the Father but by, mo, but, by, but by me. You see, I'm going to try to take a little sip of water here. <clears throat> Being such a young fellow and all, my voice gets messed up. When I get older, I'm sure it's going to get a little better. <clears throat> okay, now let's say that's any better. Okay. <clears throat> you know, when we see this, when Jesus said, No man cometh unto me and unto the Father but by me, we look at truth. Truth rules out literally all false religions, it rules them out. The gospel is the gospel. And salvation comes through Jesus Christ. And he is the only way. The Christ of the Bible is not a false, man-made idea of Christ. Now I say that, people may say, what are you talking about? Well, there's many places you can go. Many times you'll hear the word Christ and you'll hear who Christ is. But you begin, if you listen carefully, you're not hearing what the Word of God says concerning Christ. You're hearing what man has determined Christ is to be. You're hearing his explanation of who he thinks Christ should be. He's making himself literally above God. Because what he's doing is he's putting God in his image. Instead of us being in the image of God. Of understanding that that's the right attitude. That it's God that made us. And that we're our loyalty and we are his creation. But they actually make God their creation. Very, very dangerous. And that goes on a lot in today's world. And people say, well, I believe in Christ. You do? What do you believe? Do you believe that he's God? Do you believe that he was the son of God? Do you believe that he came into flesh? Do you believe that he went to a, that he lived a life in this world? was rejected and hated of the world, was crucified and died on a cross, and then literally rose bodily three days later? Do you believe that? Is that the Christ that you know? And that all things are possible with him. There's nothing that says it's impossible. And that when he did that, he did it for our sake. If we would simply receive that wonderful gift of life that he offers us by receiving his gift of life, recognizing who he is, if we would do that, 
then we would have eternal life through him. We would become part of the family of God forevermore. And he did that knowing from before the world ever was the price that he was going to pay when he set aside the glory that he had with the Father. He never set aside his deity, but he just set aside the glory that he had with the Father. Knowing he was going to step into the world and what all was going to happen in the world when he did. And yet he still did it. Now, my friends, that's love. That is really love, isn't it? How can we not see it any other way? We don't want to ever try to find God in our terms. We want to define God by His terms. And His terms are written in the Word of God. <clears throat> And then he answers this other question in this verse when he says, how can I be satisfied? When he said, we may answer this question when we say, when we might say, how, how, how can I be satisfied? And he said, I am the life. I am the life. You know, Solomon sought all the world's pleasures and beauty and all that the world could offer. Solomon thought that he could literally find all these answers as he says in as he as he says in in in, 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 in his uh, in the book he says he says all those answers were going to be under the sun I went to everything under the sun in this world of time and sense but Solomon discovered that the world can offer many pleasures and pursuits but it cannot satisfy and it cannot offer life. Remember when we read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, when we read those books, what's the thing we keep seeing? The very thing he starts with is, what's he say? Vanity upon vanity. He recognizes with all, he was the Bible tells us the greatest, wealthiest man probably the world has ever seen. I don't know. We got some pretty wealthy men today. I'm not one of them, just in case y'all were wondering. But but anyhow, we got some really well. But he had it all. And yet he came to realize that all that this world had to offer was literally vanity. And what does the word vanity mean? It means emptiness. It means uh, uncertainty. It means fruitlessness. Trifle etc. Solomon said, vanity of vanities. As we know, the fleeing aspect of our lives, the Bible tells us about a vapor. Our lives are here today and gone tomorrow. But eternity is forever. And for as a child of God, we look forward to the day that we go to be with Him. We also look forward to this day because God has purpose for us here. Yes, He did. He declared all was vanity emptiness and untruth. We must realize that life is God's gift. It's God's gift to take it, to give it, whatever. And God is the only one that can do that. If we want to live a life in this world to its fullest and enjoy life in the new and most thrilling dimension, We must come to Christ. But many of us come to Christ and we enjoy that wonderful honeymoon, I call it, with Christ for a period of time. That newness that we have and just how the world is so new and we just get so excited as we feel the the wonderful love and the warmth of knowing the Lord and the fellowship that we have and just all that we are enjoying. But as time goes on, it gets harder. In a sense, we get drawn back into the world. We get further and further away from those things. It's kind of like a marriage a lot of times. It kind of cools off after a while. It should not in our lives because God's love is unfathomable and we too can find true peace and comfort that this world will never understand no matter what kind of trials or challenges that we face as my daughter has the last three months but particularly in these last 24 hours. But she's trusting Christ She's trusting God. She knows it's okay. 
She knows it's okay, no matter what, because she's God's child. There's nothing, none, nothing that Solomon could have in this world that could ever take that place. The doctrine of the deity and the eternality of, of the Son of God. Why is it so important? It's actually paramount to the understanding, the connection in the humanity of Christ through his incarnation, which is literally where I was going to do the focus of our study this morning. And since we have another three hours to go, I'm probably going to get done. But we don't. Okay, so I'm going to pick most of this up again next week. But I thought it was important that we lay this right kind of foundational thing to understand that we need to understand this. Because when we consider the incarnation, there are two real important truths that we want to always remember about all things concerning our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in, 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 all, that we, in all of our study. The first is, is that Christ became at the same time and in the absolute sense very God and very man. That's an important doctrine of Scripture that we need to have foundationally understood and never waver on. That Jesus Christ was 100% human and he was at the same time 100% deity. He never set aside his deity. He set aside the glory that he had and he came to the world, but he did not ever set aside his deity. He is one with God as well. God the Father and God the Son. And the second is part of what we just touched on is that he literally became flesh in this world. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Through the laying aside of his glory, but in no sense his deity. His full deity and complete humanity are essential to his work on the cross. Let us realize this here this morning. If he was not man, he couldn't die. Right? If he wasn't in the flesh, he couldn't die. And if he was not God, his death would literally have no infinite value. I'm going to go ahead and close there uh, because I really don't want to go too much further than that this morning. And uh, what we'll do is we'll have, we've got a little bit of time left, so I'll kind of open it up. If anybody would like to make a comment or if anybody has any questions, please let, let, uh, be, feel free to ask at this time. Amen. And a lot of that comes from a real false conception because a lot of people know a Christ, of the, know a Christ, but it's a Christ that they have been taught. They haven't taken the time to read the Bible themselves, to seek out truth, or to sit under a good sound doctrine. They haven't really abandoned the things that they've heard, and we all can understand that. They get it. The easy way to do it is just listen, and yeah, that sounds good to me, and if they make you feel good and all that other it's good. And there's nothing wrong because certainly a study of the Word of God makes you feel good in many ways. But there's also a lot of other things in there that we need to be very much aware of. And we need to understand that Christ is Christ and His love is unfathomable. But He is a righteous God and He wants us as His children to be righteous too in our conduct and who we are. And we don't do that in the flesh, we do it in the Spirit as a child of God. But if we can't do it in the Spirit, if we don't know Him, and how do we know him? It takes a study of the word. Well, that's a blessing. Well, if you know that you, uh, you know Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, right? Then you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit can help you and help you to identify truth. But remember, Satan is very powerful. Very, very powerful. So we need to put on the full armor of God, as the Bible teaches us to do. And we do that through the studying of his word and being faithful. And understand, and understand that we fail, too, at times. Yeah, well, we have to also be careful not to, we need to be, we need to give the, we need to give the truth of God in love yeah. is the key. But we don't compromise truth, either. We can't compromise the truth, but we must give it in love and with the right spirit. The Lord Jesus died for all of us who were sinners. None of us deserve to go to heaven. So we have to always realize that that's true of everyone but we also want to cast our pearls before swine. 
We don't want to go along with people just to, just to go along and understand that we are really on different pages. But you can oftentimes open a door with the right kind of attitude, showing love and respect to another, and then allow that will, they will maybe be allowing you now to, to express and explain what you're trying to say to them and be able to, to use those things. So those, those things are really important. Well, now we are out of time, so we're going to have to close. Okay, Norman, I'm sorry.